Lord, we thank you, God, that we can come in your house. Lord God, that we can talk. We can open up the word. We can learn from the word that you will just reveal things to us in the word, Lord God. Lord God, let us all have a heart to look into the word as buried treasure. That the more we dig, the more we find. Lord God, just open up our eyes, open up our ears, our hearts, our minds, Lord God, to receive the message tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, if you do not delve into the doctrine of predestination and election and eternal security, you're really not digging into the gospel. Okay? You have to get into and learn exactly what salvation is. And who controls it? Okay? And a lot of people say, well, it really don't matter. And the more I study it, the more I realize it does matter. Okay? Because there's two planes of thought out there. Either God is sovereign and in control of everything, or man is sovereign and in control and controls God. Okay? That's your two main looks of thought. One, one is... Um, Monergism, the other one is synergism, okay? We're not going to get into that too much tonight. What we're going to do, though, is I'm going to talk a little bit and explain it. And if anybody has any questions or has anything to say, just, well, it's going to be open discussion here, okay? I want feedback from you guys. I want, whenever we walk away tonight, I want us to have a good, solid, firm foundation in predestination, election, and eternal security, Okay? We got it? We good? All right. We're not debating, though. And I don't think anybody in here is going to debate, but I'm just saying. It's not a debate. It's just we're going to talk, okay? For some people who don't know this, if you ever see me wear a hat or a shirt that says 1689, there's a reason why I do it, okay? The 1689 Second London Confessional lays out a lot of stuff that the Southern Baptists actually adopted and then revamped and rechanged, and now we have the Baptist faith and message. But the original Baptist, Southern Baptist faith and message came from the 1689 Second London Confessional. Okay? Now, I love the wording of the 1689 London Confessional more than I like the revised 2000 version of the Baptist faith and message. Okay? I think it lays stuff out clearly. Now, the Baptist faith and message is what we have in the back of our things, and that's our basic our doctrines of faith, okay, of what we believe and everything. But let's dig into it and let's see some roots of some Baptist stuff, okay? Now it goes actually further back all the way to Paul. Predestination election, it actually goes all the way back to God in the beginning, okay? But the arguments and the, the, the siding comes from Paul started having to fix things, okay? That's why he wrote to Galatians, he wrote to the Ephesians, he wrote to the Corinthians, he wrote to all these people, okay? Then you had art, main arguments between Pelagius and Augustine in the early centuries, okay? Which they had some councils that deem Pelagianism heretical, okay, then later on you had some more, and then you had a church split, and then you had John Huss, and then you had Martin Luther preaching this, and then we had a guy named John Calvin, which, which ended up having the term Calvinism and Arminianism stemming from it, okay? Now, Calvinism nowadays is a bad word. If you say Something about being a Calvinist or Calvinism, it's a bad word. Even though in the Synod of Dort in the 1600s, Arminianism was deemed heretical and Calvinism was deemed biblical. Okay? You ever hear whatever we talked about being reformed? Okay? Everybody's reformed. Okay? You're either reformed or you're Catholic. Okay? But then reformed theology became a bad word because it's associated with Calvinism. Okay? So, we're going to dig into some roots and see where a lot of this stuff comes from, okay? God hath decreed in himself 
from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably all things whatsoever come to pass, yet so as thereby is God neither the author of sin, nor hath fellowship with any therein, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature, nor yet is the liberty or the contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established, in which appears his wisdom in disposing all things and power and faithfulness in accomplishing his decree. Okay? Now, some backing in the word comes from Isaiah 46.10. Okay, if you're taking notes, there, there's going to be a lot of scripture. Okay, I'm just warning you first up. Isaiah 46.10 says, Declaring the end of the be from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Okay? So what God is saying is, whatever I say goes. That's what that big thing I just read says. God says, I'm sovereign. What I say goes. Period. Amen. Period. If I say it, it's going to happen. Okay? So we got to establish that, that God is in control and what he says goes. Okay? Romans 9. Uh, let's go to Ephesians 1.11. Okay, we're going to go through these kind of quick. In him we have tamed an inheritance, having been predestined, there's that word, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to what? The counsel of his will. There's the counsel of his will again, okay? Let's go to Hebrews 6, 17. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. Okay, <laughs> Romans 9, 15. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. God is in control. Right. Period. Okay? I like uh, this guy, Vody Bochum, and he says, listen. He said, a lot of things that we start to get concerned with is above our pay grade. Why does God do this? I don't know. That's Him. He is in control. I'm not. And who am I to ask God, why are you doing this? Okay? And this is what He's declaring right here. I will have, this is God talking, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion, according to my will. It's my will. This is God talking and confirming to people. Now people say, well, I don't want to serve a God like that. Then you can look him in the face when you're getting ready to go to hell and you can tell him all what you want. Plain and simple. Okay? Let's go to verse 18. He says, so then he has mercy on whoever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Okay? James 1, 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. You sin because that is your nature. Okay? When Adam fell, all sin, all mankind fell with Adam. Our nature is to sin. God doesn't make us sinful. Okay? We're going to go over that in a second. Just remember these things. 1 John 1.5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Okay? Acts 4, 27, 28. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Next verse. To do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Okay? We're going to explain all that. John 19, 11. Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. All right? So Jesus himself is saying, You have no authority over me except what was given to you. Plain and simple. Because we go back to God is in control. He does what he wants to do. Okay? 
Numbers 23, 19. God is not man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. He has said and he will not do it or has spoken and he will not fulfill it. God does not change his mind. What he decreed from the beginning goes forth. Okay? Ephesians 1, 3 and 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us us in him when before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will okay there's no contradiction between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility okay man is responsible man is accountable for his sins one of the fallacies of this doctrine of predestination and election is that it removes man's accountability and it removes man's responsibility. Man is still responsible and he is still held accountable for his actions and his deeds. Okay? We all on the same page right now? Any questions? Okay. Now... Let's look at Acts 15, 18. Known from of old. Okay? Remember this. Now let's go to Romans 9, 11. And we're going to go all the way to 18, I think. Though they were not yet born and had nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Next verse. As it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I Okay. Let's go. Next verse. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Next verse. So then he has mercy on whoever he wills, and he hardens whoever he wills. Okay? Now. Most people, you want to see some really, really butchering up? Let an Arminian try to properly exegete Romans 9. They will do some serious acrobatics because they cannot get through this part. Okay? A lot of times people think, okay... Well, God just looked down the corridor of time and saw who was going to choose him. So then he chose them and loved them. And it's like that does not make God sovereign at all. That makes God a time traveler. Okay? If God looked through the corridor of time and said, okay, Renee, you're going to choose me. And Dave, you're going to choose me. And Sue, you're going to choose me. So I'm going to elect you guys. Because I already know foreknowledge that you're going to pick me, so I'm going to pick you. This is how they try to explain foreknowledge. Okay? That's not God being sovereign, not one bit. Go ahead, Miss Angie. Yeah, he definitely did. So what did that tell you? Exactly. We were exactly, we were predestined. Okay, okay. Here's another question: If God knew, because He is omniscient, why did He create Satan? This is a big thing that a lot of people have a hard time swallowing. Is whenever you tell them, Satan is God's Satan. Satan has no authority over anything that God does not give him the authority over. God gave him the authority over this earth right now for a time. God gave Satan the authority to attack Job. Job had to go to heaven and ask for permission. Um, yeah, Satan had to go to heaven to ask permission to attack Job. 
Think about that for a second. Before you want to throw out, the devil's attacking me. Really? Then God must have given him permission to do it. Think about it. That's scriptural. And listen. Listen. Listen, listen, listen. You don't engage in conversation with the devil. The only person in scripture that ever engaged in conversation with the devil blew it for everybody. Her name was Eve. Find me another person that had a conversation with Satan besides Jesus. And Jesus always answered him back with scripture. He spoke the word of God to him, okay? Whenever the archangel Michael and Jude, they were fighting over and disputing over Moses' body, the archangel Michael didn't even get into a confrontation with Satan. All he did was, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Remember that. Okay? Before you post something stupid on Facebook. <laughs> okay. God did not look down the corridor of time. Let's go back to Romans. Let's throw up Romans 9. Let's start in like verse 8 or something like that. And we're going to go through this little part real quick. So we could be on the same page. I should have gave it to y'all, but uh, I think I skipped through instead. I want you to really get this point right here because it's a major point in learning about what predestination and election is, okay? Like I said, God is not a time traveler where, I mean, God does see all of it. He sees the whole picture. We only see a vapor of time. God sees it all. The whole scope, okay? And he predestines and he elects who he wills for his will to be done on the earth. Okay? It's not for our will. And the thought that we have control over certain things would make us in control and not God. If we make the decisions, then God would have to... Every time a person would make a decision to either be saved or not saved, then God would have to change his plan. What sense does that make? That makes man sovereign, not God. And that makes God a puppet moving to our will. The devil is a puppet, right? The devil is his puppet. You got to remember that. Okay, so y'all got it? Romans 9? It started like verse 8. I want to read it before I get into it, before I break it down a little bit. It's not coming up? No. All right. Soldiers, it's time for you to learn how to wield the sword. Yeah. Romans 9 in your Bible. Let's start in verse 6, actually. Okay, Romans 9, 6. Romans is right after Acts. It's in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Acts. Romans. Verse numero six. Okay. It says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Neither are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. On the contrary, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. That is, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but the children of the promise are considered to be the offspring. For this is the statement of the promise. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. And not only that, but also Rebekah received a promise when she became pregnant by one man, our ancestor Isaac. For through her sons, for though her sons had not been born yet, 
For though her sons had not been born yet or done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to the election might stand, not from works, but from the one who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. God hated Esau before he was even in the womb. Think about that. For that his purpose of election might stand. Okay? And he says, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. God did not look down the corridor of time and see that Esau was not going to respond favorably, but Jacob was going to respond favorably and say, this is, this is who I'm going to love. I'm going to love Jacob. No, he declared it from the beginning that Jacob was going to be the lineage, not Esau. Even though Esau was going to be the firstborn. Okay? When people say that God looked down the corridor of time and saw who was going to pick favorably as a wrong view of election. That's not election. That is not God being sovereign, but God, like I said, being a time traveler. That is God not having any power whatsoever, no control. He is absolutely helpless just being able to see the future. And who is going to choose him and therefore lie to us and make us believe that he is sovereign? That's not predestination. That's not election. And it's a wrong view. Predestination is not making a decision because you know the outcome. Predestination is making a decision because you don't, you know. Because you are God. And that's what a lot of people can't grasp. We try to make God and bring him down to our human way of thinking. And he's not. Okay? Predestination, not making a decision because you know the outcome. That's like thinking a news anchor has special powers because he saw a video before you did and then tell you, watch right here. Watch what's getting ready to happen. Look in the lower part, the right part of your screen. You'll see this happening. That's not special powers. That's just knowing something before you do. God is not like that. That is bringing God down to a level that he's not. A lot of people think that that's what foreknowledge is. Probably the most common evasion is from those who would see foreknowledge as something that figures into God's election choice. And by that, they mean that he foreknew by looking ahead into the future to discover what was going to happen. And when he knew, and when he learned, God doesn't learn anything. God is not an evolving thing in the sky that learns our behavior. He's all-knowing. He knows everything. He doesn't change his plan because we change our minds. God is not schizophrenic. And he's not, he does not have multiple personalities. Okay? They say whenever he knew and he learned through his foresight who was going to respond positively to the gospel, then he chose those people. This is actual stuff that I get whenever I get into debates with people. And everybody who leans to, this, to the, this side, the reform camp gets the same verbiage from the other side. Right. So therefore, before he, down this tunnel, he didn't know. That's what they say. His foreknowledge and his foresight was because he looked through the corridor of time and saw who was going to choose him favorably, and that's the ones that he chose. So that puts it, salvation in whose hands? And not God's. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. You got to jump through hoops and twist a lot of scripture to make the other side, which is Arminianism, work. Okay? Now. Okay. If God looks into the future to see who's going to believe, you have two problems. Number one, that means that the believer himself is the one that makes the decisive choice, not God. And we just read a lot of scripture that said, who's in control? God. And that goes against many, 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 many scriptures that say God is the one who chooses.
Okay? In fact, I'm going to give you all a few of those. Okay, you can just write this stuff down, okay? I'm going to give them to you quick. I'm going to read them. You don't have to worry about throwing them up. Matthew 24, 22. And if those days had not been cut short, no human would be saved. For the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Matthew 24, 31. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Mark 13, 20. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human would be saved. For the sake of the elect, he chose, he shortened the days. Okay, it's just doubling it up. Mark 13, 27 says the same thing, and he will send out his angels to gather his elect from the four winds. Okay? John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Period. That should be it. End of story. No more debate. Exactly. But you know what they say? Well, he was talking to the disciples. I said, let's just tear up the Bible because Romans was written to the Romans. They're all dead. Corinthians are written to the Corinthians. Find the Corinthian church. You ain't going to find it. So that's irreverent. Irrelevant to the fact. Yes, he was talking to the disciples. What are we? There we go. Then he had to reaffirm it 20 verses later. He said, John 6, 65, he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. John 15, 16, you did not chose me, but I chose you. Hold on, Cole. And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and whatever you ask in my Father's name, he may give it to you. Go ahead, Cole. Say that again. We're going to get to that in a second. That's a good, I'm actually covering that. That's a good one. I'm going to finish with these verses on being chosen and then we'll. No, I don't. I, no, I'm going co to cover it. I got that in my notes to cover that, that question. Because that's a common question in this. Well, what if, what if. I go to church. What if I'm not one of the chosen ones? You will know. It's like, you wouldn't be asking that question. Because <laughs> you wouldn't care. Ask an atheist if they care if they're chosen or not. So we're going to go over that. That's a good question. Exactly. Exactly. You wouldn't be here if you wouldn't be chosen. Okay? But we'll go through that. Because there are some that come in that aren't really chosen. Okay. Acts 9.15. But the Lord said to him, Go for he is chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. <laughs> Romans 8.33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Okay. Because a lot of people say, well, if you take Romans out of the Bible, y'all don't have a leg to stand on. It's like, well, what about all the words that Jesus said? You want to tear that out too? Where do we stop tearing it out? Then we're going to be like Thomas Jefferson cutting it out, the Bible, the stuff we don't like. Like I said the other day, a lot of people rather have a Sharpie instead of a highlight in the Bible so they can black out what they don't like. Okay? Romans 9, 11, we, we read that. They have not been born. They did nothing good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue. Romans 11, 5 to 7. So too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. Watch this. Let me have a group of 10 people come up real quick. Come on. 10 people. 10. Ten people come up. That's good. However many people. That's fine. That's fine. No, this is fine. Okay. Well, however many group. Okay. All right. Watch this. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go, Lila. Here you go, Mr. Mike. All right. Y'all go sit down. The guys who gave the, I gave the money to, y'all go sit down. Everybody else stay up. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Y'all didn't get no money, right? You mad? You have no right to be mad because you went, you went owed anything. That's grace. If God chooses to pick these people and not these, it's God's grace that he chose these people because your default destination is hell. Okay? So if you're heading towards hell and God decides to start plucking and picking people out of it and saving them, the rest of the people shouldn't get mad and upset that they're going to hell because they're not going to care. That's to answer your question. They're not going to care because their hearts are hardened. You could preach the gospel to them until you blew in the face. If they're not chosen, they won't answer the call. They will not receive it. Okay, everybody gave money to you. Come back and give me that money. <laughs> and look, I got three more pages of chosen. If you want to come find me after the service, I'll give you all the other chosen stuff. Okay? All right, now I'm going to combat this, okay? Jesus, like you said, says, you haven't chosen me, I chose you, okay? In Thessalonians, Paul writes to the Thessalonians that emphasize the fact that they are saved by God's choice, God's choice, okay? The other problem with thinking that you have control is saying, ultimately, if it's my choice, you're going to make the wrong choice. Okay? Because the Bible says no one is seeking after God. No one. What does that mean? No one. No one is seeking after God. Okay. Now to get back to what I was saying earlier about Pelagianism. Okay. To put it as simply, it starts with the denial of the doctrine of original sin. It's a denial that Adam's sin in any way affects the outcome. Okay. We have to believe that people are born sinful. We're not born good on a path to heaven and then we mess up and then we take a path to hell. Everyone is on the path to hell because of Adam's fall. If we wasn't all on the path to hell, then Jesus didn't have to come down and die. We would have just had to do go by works and be good people. But we know that doesn't work. The Bible says it's not by works you have been saved, but by grace. Okay? And Pelagianism says this, and I get into these debates with people, and I say, whoa, 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 let's back up. Let's get some groundwork here first. Do you believe that we are born sinful or that men are born good? And most of the time, they'll say, men are born good. And I'm like, then the Bible, then we're done. No more reason for debate until you read the Bible. Because if men are born good, then all we have to do is, listen, if we're born good, if we're born good, that means all the babies in the womb are good, right? So why are we, out, why are we so gung-ho against abortion? Let the babies die and go to heaven. When a baby comes out, let's just slit their throat. If we're born good, let them go to heaven before they have a chance to screw it up. You see where that doesn't make a bit of sense? And that's Pelagianism. That was deemed heresy in the early 300th century. And then it got revamped into Arminianism. And then we're hearing it again today. And 500 years later, we're still battling. It's like it was deemed heresy every time it comes up. <coughs> okay, you ever heard of a man named Charles Finney? Charles Finney was a guy who I have debated with people over many times. He is the one who basically would go and start these revivals in these towns and he would scare people into making a decision for Christ. Okay? And he would go and he would say, you make a decision for Christ, everybody's going to hell. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. You, do you want to go to hell? Do you? Answer. No. Then make Jesus the Lord over your life. Repeat this prayer after me. 
Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm heading for hell. Please come into my heart. I hear you knocking on my heart, begging for me to open it up. And then he would leave the town. And he would say, hey, we had 500 people. Get saved. And you had 500 people <coughs> heading for hell. More than what they were before because they thought they were secure in their belief of saying this prayer would save them. And he ran around the whole United States doing this. And then there was another guy who did it in the 1900s. And he's still alive today and everybody praises him. And says salvation is 99% God's work and 1% man. We just got to make the decision. And that's Billy Graham. And it crept into the Baptist churches to where we say, you walk the aisle and make a decision for Christ. Or are you going to make a decision for Christ today? You can't make the decision according to Scripture. <coughs> you might like the biggest you. Because if I sit here and I just say, hey, do you want to go to hell? Everybody's like this, hell no, I don't want to go to hell. I repeat a prayer, and then you walk out, and the, the preachers tell you, once saved, always saved, brother. Welcome to the kingdom of God. I, Lord, you just went over this man, and you just cleansed him of his sin. It's a new man. Hallelujah. And then the guy never had any change in him whatsoever. He repeated a prayer. Now he goes out, and he sins just like he did before, living the life he did before, doing whatever he wanted to do. And I'm going to use Jamie because I know him. You know, sleeping around on his wife, drinking, acting the fool. And everybody sees him and goes, I'm saved. Once saved, always saved. Because I said this prayer. No, you was never saved. You repeated a prayer that's sending you to hell. We see why we have to get salvation right first. Because a lot of people who say they are saved are not really saved. They just repeated a meaningless prayer. But there was nothing that ever happened inside. Their hearts are still hardened. Exactly. If you ever come up for, if you ever come up and you say, I think I'm ready to get saved, I test you right there. I had a few people say, I don't know if I'm, I don't know. I said, well, whenever you know for sure that God has called you, come back up. Watch this. So Pelagianism and Arminianism says that all of us are born essentially blank slates and we have, we have the choice to either be good or evil. Okay? See how it hinges on human choice and not God? It pulls the sovereignty away from God whenever you preach that and teach that. Okay? We're, we're evil by our own choice, not because of the sinful tendencies that we inherited from Adam. That's what they teach. And it's like that's totally not what Scripture says. Scripture says we, are, we inherited the sin from Adam. Okay? Out of that, what you get is total graceless theology. There's no grace in it. It's total works. <coughs> total works. See, going back to Charles Finney, he, this is what he'd say at his little revivals. He would say, look, if you want to be saved, just choose not to sin. Oh. That's some of the stupidest advice I ever hear for addicts. Oh, you alcoholic? Stay out of the bars and don't drink. Duh. Oh, you're a drug addict? You're addicted to meth? Erase all the drug dealers out your phone and don't do meth anymore. <laughs> Dummy. <laughs> it's not that easy. If it'd be that easy, they wouldn't be doing it. Okay, so Charles Finney went around and said, if you want to be saved, just don't sin. Exactly. That's the point. Exactly. You see how easy it is? See how easy it is? 
They say, stop sinning, you can be saved. He even preached a sermon called, Make for Yourself a New Heart. That's the that name of one of his sermons, Make your, for Yourself a New Heart, where he taught that as an unredeemed person, you could, by sheer force of your own will, change your own heart, and that's contrary to what Scripture teaches. And you could, therefore, redeem yourself. See, the problem with that is it gives the sinner all the credit that he doesn't deserve. And it also lays a burden on his back that he cannot possibly bear. Okay? Most Arminianism is a kind of semi-Pelagiism, okay? After Pelagius passed from the scene and his teachings were declared a heresy, there arose a modification of Pelagius' teaching. That's the technical name is semi-Pelagiism. And it says that we were damaged by Adam's sin. It did affect us. We did inherit sinful tendencies, but... God gives grace to all of humanity, restores us to a place where we can make a free choice. So, again, Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism puts the choice on the human. Okay? Which is wrong. It's never our choice. Okay? The standard, typical American evangelism, which I cannot stand, which I go against a lot, Attempts to manipulate the man or the woman to soft sell the gospel. Take the offense out of it. Entertain you. Do whatever you need to do to get the people in the doors to hear a semi-gospel message. Because it's all about getting that person to make a decision so we can put another mark on our belt and say, I got another person to say a prayer. And the whole concept of decisions and invitations and, you know, the upteen verses that they use of just as I am and all the things that go with an effort to manipulate because it's based upon a semi-Pelagian, Arminian view that man is the ultimate decider in his salvation. The whole thing with Finney, where it started, launched the entire false gospel and a whole idea of evangelism that manipulates people's minds to get them to the point where they make this decision. In the, what was it, Brother Dave? In the 50s, there was a big push in the Baptists to make decisions for Christ, right? How many of those people actually were really saved? I don't know. I, I, you really can't make, only God can make that decision, but... Exactly. Exactly. Because you get caught up in the moment. And you... you 94%. 90, yeah, that's a lot. 94%. So that's only six people out of every hundred people who were really, ten years later, saved. That's not a good average. But if we read the Bible, hold on. If we read the Bible, it says, narrow is the way and wide is the path to hell. So the 94 percent, you got to remember that. People don't read that enough. Right. <coughs> Narrow, as in one way, Jesus. Yeah, you yeah, you can't even find that way. He got to show you the way. You know that song? Show me the way. Huh? Exactly. He's the light that sh lights the path that shows you the way. Okay, I love that. Okay, and that's scriptural. All right. Y'all want to keep on or y'all want to stop right here? Let me ask this question. Who really wants to be that person to say, I want to stop right here and go home? <laughs> like, I had enough. <laughs> oh, yeah, y'all do have puppet practice and uh, deacons do have... Well, look, we only, look, we only on page 3 of 12. We're going to pause right here, okay? 
Okay, do we have, let me, let's, just, let's just get this out of the way. Do we have a good understanding that God is the one who makes the choice? Yes. Okay, next week, okay, or maybe, I don't know, not next week because I'm talking with the kids. We're going to talk about how man's choice plays into that. Okay? Because there is a balancing act of God who chooses and man responding. Okay? And that's where most people who are against Calvinism think that we become robots and we can't make a decision. Okay? The gospel goes out, that's, because that's one of their things too, and I got it in there. Then why preach the gospel? Because that's the way God chose to get his word out to see who's the elect. Okay, the gospel goes out, okay, God then chooses, okay, because people were predestined, right, to choose, okay, God knows who will choose, let me rephrase that, okay, the gospel message goes out, and then man has a response, okay, now what we're going to talk about the next time is man's response to that, and can you refuse the call? See, we're going to dig deep, okay? Because I want everybody to have a good understanding of what we believe, what we teach. And because we got to have some good foundation and we have to have some deep foundation, okay? Watch this. If you want to build a small house, okay, who over here knows anything about building houses or anything? Everybody ever built a house? Okay. Okay. All right, when you build, when you build, you got to have a good foundation, right? Okay? A, sci a skyscraper, okay, doesn't have a shallow foundation. It has a deep foundation. Okay, so as a church, okay, how deep is going to be our foundation determines how tall and how high we're going to go. Okay? If we want to stay shallow, we're just going to have a shallow foundation. And we're just going to dig into just this much of the word. And we're going to skim it and we're going to come out. We're going to skim it and we're going to come out. Okay? Most of Christianity, like they say, is two inches deep and five miles wide. It's shallow. Okay? People don't like to dig deep. I like to go deep because when you go deep, you can go higher. When you go deep, you can go higher. Okay, that's what a skyscraper does. They dig deep first, and then they go high. We can't, if we go high without the deep foundation, guess what happens? We topple over. Exactly. 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 It's like if I would just sit here and throw all this baggage on you and expect you to jump. You ain't going to be able to jump until you take some baggage off. Same thing with the flesh. Take the flesh off, the higher you can go. Okay, so we're going to dig deep into this so everybody has a good, firm understanding of salvation, how a man is saved, and be able to explain it if someone asks. Because the worst thing you want to do is when someone says, can I be saved, is say, are you elect? <laughs> you don't want to say that, and that's how most people think Calvinists are. Okay, now that now there are some that jump to this cage stage hyper Calvinism where it doesn't matter if they elect, they're gonna come. Okay, that's a wrong view. All right, because if a person is asking, guess what? Chances are they're elect and they're called and they're hearing the call and they're chosen. Because, like I said before, an atheist don't care about predestination and election, and he don't care about God. Okay, and I think a lot of times we spend a lot of time trying to convince somebody, okay, while these people are on the wayside just begging for someone to tell them about Jesus. And we're sitting here wasting our time trying to convince a goat to become a sheep when there are sheep sitting on the side waiting for the shepherd. Okay, the gospel call goes out, okay, men respond because they are chosen, okay. So just keep that in mind. We're going to dig deeper into that. Not next week, but the week after, because next week, talking about sex with the kids. 
Homecoming's coming up, prom's coming up, all these things are coming up. Kids have cell phones and all this stuff, and they get into a lot of trouble. And I'm going to talk to them about it. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Any questions on what we talked about before we leave? Okay. Mm-hmm. We gotta, you gotta remember that God does all the choosing. Yeah. Yeah. God chose Paul on the road to Damascus. Okay. Knocked him off the horse and said, "Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me?" Okay. And then, then watch this. This is how God works. Okay. Then. Paul, well, Saul goes to this place, and then, then uh, what is his name? Ananias yeah. gets the call to go preach to Paul, and he's like, "Who? <laughs> the one who has been persecuting us and, and and slaughtering all the Christians? I, what? Okay, think about that. Paul was going. That's a side note. Think about this. This is how God works. Okay." Saul was going around persecuting Christians and killing them. Okay, he was going he was going to Damascus to persecute Christians. Okay? Gets radically transformed and starts preaching to the people that he probably probably was the family of the people that he had stoned and killed because they were preaching the gospel. Think about that. Think about if someone came around and started killing Christians. Let's say a Muslim would come. To, to this area, to Homa, and start persecuting and killing Christians. It was legal. Okay, the governor would say, okay, Christianity <coughs> is deemed, therefore, illegal, and whoever practices Christianity will be beheaded. And they would allow the Muslim state to come in and start beheading people. And then the head of that, okay, would get radically saved, and he would have killed most of you guys' families <laughs> And some of you guys, and I would come in here and announce, hey, guess what? Omar Akbar is coming in here to preach Sunday. And y'all know that he pulled y'all families out of the house and beheaded them. Y'all watched that happen. <coughs> That's the things I think about whenever I read the Bible. <laughs> All right, then we're going to close in prayer and uh, y'all got puppet practice and the guys who are for the, uh, up for deacons y'all have a sharp meeting with brother Dave and myself so Lord we thank you for this night we thank you God that we can dig deep into your word Lord God and that we can learn what your word says and what you want us to believe Lord God not uh, just made up stuff from different men over the years Lord God but what your word says Lord God we love you and we thank you for the knowledge we thank you for the gift of repentance. We thank you for the gift of grace that you give us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.